Well, greetings, everyone. Welcome to Heartline Ministry. There's been a lot of questions these days as to what does it take to become a Christian. Paul is going to address that in the book of Galatians. That is our new study, and we're going to address that today. What does it take to be a Christian? See you in a few minutes. Well, greetings once again, everyone. Welcome to Heartline Ministry. This is a ministry where we take the Word of God and we apply it to the hearts of men because we know that God is wanting to work on the hearts of men. And we're going to be starting a brand new study. I'm excited, Tim, for this study because it's in the book of Galatians. Hmm. And I think if there's a book that really is relevant for today... It is this book of Galatians because he goes and there's many kinds of, uh, many people wanting to present some sort of a gospel message. But Paul goes and approaches us and says, there's only one gospel. Mm -hmm. There's only one gospel message that is going to make the difference. And that is the message of the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ and nothing else. Mm -hmm. So we asked the question earlier, what does it take to be saved? Well, we know out of Ephesians, for example, by grace through faith mm -hmm. is how it happens. You know, and, and that's how it happens. We can't add anything else to it. Yet, in the book of Galatians, they tried to add mm -hmm. things to it, right? Yeah, well, that first you actually quoted, you know, it said, and not by works, lest yeah. any man should boast, you know. And so it's understanding that, and, and that's what really separates Christianity from all the other religions. All the other religions have some aspect of me trying to achieve, me trying to gain, what it is that might be more holy or Jewish to be able to acquire some greater status in heaven. But with Christianity, God did not leave room for that. And because with that, if we have that mentality, pride is at the root of it. And this is the very thing that caused Satan to fall from heaven to begin with, was pride. So it's only stands to reason that the religions that he would conjure up would have that at the, at the forefront. But with Christianity, I mean, true biblical Christianity based on a relationship with Jesus Christ, as you said, that, that is based on nothing more than the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ, and that has nothing to do with me, it means it's all about him. The only part I play is to accept, but anybody can accept. Yep. So it, it doesn't allow me to be able to say, well, I was able to achieve something greater than the next guy. It requires nothing but the blood of Christ and understand that it's what he came to do, not what we strive to do that can get us um, acquisition into heaven. You know, I was reading and out of Exodus 12, having to do with the Passover, and one of the commands that was given to the Jews during the Passover is you have to eat all of the lamb. Mm -hmm. How many people today in our world, in our society, in our culture, wants to only eat just a little bit of the lamb or this this thing that meets my need but not mm -hmm. eat all of the lamb mm -hmm. and we need to to take all of him mm -hmm. you can't take just little bits and pieces that we prefer that which is you know what we like and not not take what we don't like mm -hmm. those those things that where god is convicting me or god is dealing with my heart and pulling at my heart strings right and and paul is, is hitting all of that in the book of galatians as as we go through it you know so I'm, I'm excited about this because today in our world it just seems like so many religions and so many groups and so forth are trying to add to the gospel mm -hmm. And Paul is dealing with that. They wanted to add circumcision to the gospel. The Jews saying, oh, this is how you're going to be saved. And God is dealing with the Gentiles. And, it, of course, the Gentiles would reject that, and I don't blame them. 
And, you know, and Paul is saying, no, we can't do that to them. You know, that is not a part of the real gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to, you know, to go through this book, because I just love this book anyway, talking about law, talking about grace, talking about liberty, talking about license, talking about all those things that today is a part of our culture, part of our, our Christian heritage even. Right. And to me, it's, it's very real and very predominant in our, in our world. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask Tim if he would open in prayer. And then I'm going to read the first 10 verses of Galatians chapter 1. And listen very carefully because Paul, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't sugarcoat a whole lot of stuff. I mean, he goes right to the mm -hmm. juggler vein. And even in the very first 10 verses of this, he's mm -hmm. going right for the juggler. So, Lord, we do thank you so much for being able to have this time to not just read your word, but to be able to hear your voice to us, even today, here in the 21st century. That, Lord God, you are real. You want to communicate your truth. You want to communicate your heart to us. Would you give us a heart to receive and a mind to be able to understand what it is that you want to release in us so that, Lord, we can walk more fully in your complete rest. And, Lord, we give you honor and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen and amen. And I also want to tell you that we have a live audience today. Uh, Pastor Ron Golden is here. That would be Tim's dad. Uh, every once in a while when he comes over and visits Tim, he comes and sits in the studio with us. And Ron, it's a joy to have you with us, buddy. And uh, pipe in if you need to or if you want to. We'd love to have you. Um, you know, it, it's, Tim, as, as, as I start to read this, I was asked a question at lunch. In fact, Pastor Ron asked a question. Do you think, is, is, is this the end because we're seeing everything come to a head, or could there possibly be a revival before everything comes to the head? And I kind of answered that I think that there may be a revival looming, mm -hmm. a revival coming, um, only because I see that people are hurting so bad, and, and the way that you know fear and mm -hmm. anger and all this stuff, they got it, you know, they, they want, they're looking for something. Mm -hmm. And it is my prayer, and I know it's yours and Pastor Ron's prayer, that, boy, you know, if we can look to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, then we can have, see a grand revival just before Christ takes the church away. That's right. And that's what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I really am. I'm looking for God to give us just one more shot at this. Mm -hmm. And that would be so fitting with what we know of the character of God. Right. What you see throughout Scripture. And the fact that he gave his son. And now the millions that have come to know him over the generations is, is great. And, and I don't want to undermine or mm -hmm. un underestimate the importance of those lives. Or, or that somehow those lives were less than anything. But I cannot see the father wanting to look at his son and say, you know, I not willing to allow your death to have more value than what it's already had. I think he wants to cause Christ's death to be as fruitful as it possibly can. And that would cause one more great revival to really come forth. And unlike a lot of the other revivals that we've talked about um, or that we have seen, they've been pretty much bound by, na by nations. Uh, there's maybe been a revival that's happened here or one that's happened in Ireland or one that's happened in the in third world countries. But I think that the one that's about to come is one that's going to have a global significance. It's going to be a revival that's going to make all the other revivals seem commonplace almost in comparison. You know, I, I was... I love the way you brought that because last night at prayer meeting, these are the scriptures that I brought out uh, in dealing with it. It says, uh, talking about the resurrection, if there be no resurrection of the dead, then is Christ not risen? And then verse 14, this is in 1 Corinthians 15, and if Christ be not risen, then our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Mm -hmm. Verse 17, if Christ be not raised, your faith is vain you are yet in your sins. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, we just celebrated the great resurrection of Jesus Christ and that he has conquered sin, he has conquered death, he is alive, mm -hmm. um, 
you know, in that we believe, for example, he's right here in the studio with us, right. um, ministering, talking, ministering to your hearts, wherever you're listening from, wherever, wherever you're watching from, guess what? God is able to be with you at the very same time that he's with us, and he can do the work. And therefore, I, I have to, in my heart of hearts, still believe that God has one last push that he's going to give to mankind mm -hmm. to accept his son as their personal Savior and their Lord. Yeah. Now, you know, I may be all wet with this, but that's really what my prayer is and what my desire mm -hmm. is, is, is one more great revival, not only locally, but globally mm -hmm. around the world. And that's why we, you know, we're on this program, mm -hmm. you know, to try to globally reach people for Jesus Christ. And we're in what, what 26 countries? 24 countries. 24 yeah. countries right now. And, you know, so, you know, we're trying to reach out globally so that people will come to know who Jesus Christ is and this gospel that um, we're preaching. Mm -hmm. You know, let me, let me read the first 10 verses of Galatians chapter 1, and then we're going to get into, a, 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 I would think, a very lively, very wonderful discussion concerning it. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father, and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from the present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are not so soon removed from him, that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. And we said therefore, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you, then that you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men of God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Mm. Boy, I tell you what, that is, that is so prevalent today. And especially mm -hmm. that last verse. I mean, we're going to get into all of it. But just that last verse, how many today think that they're in the gospel ministry, but they, they kowtow or they bow down to the whims of people. Mm -hmm. And we can't do that. Right. You know, we just cannot do that. We don't see the, the apostles doing it. Mm -hmm. Remember back in the days, just after uh, the death of Jesus and so forth, and they were thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, they would say, look, I'm going to whip you, and they would whip them with 39 lashes or whatever, and say, do not preach the gospel. But what were they found doing as soon as they left the, the palace? They were preaching out the preaching the gospel. You know, they, they just, we can't do it. Mm -hmm. You know, who is our God? Is it, is it man, or is it society, or is it government, or... Is it God? Mm -hmm. And I think Paul is hitting that right on the head as he goes and he presents this to us. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the neat things, Tim, that you know, I think for you and me and, and so many um, in the ministry is that we, we are not called by man. Right. At least I would hope that even though I, you know, I serve at a church and, and you know, been there a long time and you serve at a church and been there quite a while, but we're not there through men. We're there because God has called us. Mm -hmm. God has ordained us. God is the one who, who has presented us to mm -hmm. bring the gospel, whether it be here on Hotline, whether it be in our local churches, or wherever, our local towns. Um, and Paul's saying the same thing. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And isn't that what really pushes us? It is. In fact, when we think about this fact... Uh, Paul, Paul, of course, wasn't one of the original 12. Right. He, he became the second 12th, yep. you know, uh, because what we had happen, of course, is we read through the gospel accounts leading up to Christ's resurrection. We had 12, but then after Judas had betrayed Christ and realized what he did, he went out and he hung himself, left a vacancy, if you will, 
So what took place after that was the disciples figured we need, or the other apostles said, we need to have replacement. Somebody needs to take Judas's place. So who is that one going to be? And I find something very interesting. What they do is they cast lots. Yeah. In other words, eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Right. You know, who's going to be the one? We've got some ideas, but let, let's pick one that we think fits the mold the best. We as the appointed men mm -hmm. that, that are here. And that man that got chosen was a man named Matthias. And that's all you really ever hear of Matthias. Don't hear of him anymore. And th only from the, at that point. And so, but you see then what takes place is Paul with his situation on the road to Damascus. And now all of a sudden here you've got God's choice for that 12th apostle. Matthias may have gotten the title, but Paul had the anointing. Yep. You know, and there, and there was a big difference. And it's important to understand, and he knew this. He had to understand, look, I was not chosen by man. In fact, in essence, I think what he's saying in this is, if it was up to the other 11, they wouldn't have chosen yeah, me. Right. <laughs> you know, I mean, and let's face it, he was, he was persecuting the church prior to his conversion. He probably would have been the last person, even after he made a profession of faith, for them to choose to fill that role. But God saw something different in him. You know, what is really interesting is after Paul's conversion, and God had told him, you've got to go see a man by the name of Apollos, Mm -hmm. Can you imagine them going to Apollos and say, by the way, you're going to have a visitor, mm -hmm. and his name is Saul. What do you think Apollos would say? Right. Absolutely not. Don't bring him in here. He, he wants to slay me. He wants to kill me. Mm -hmm. You know, that kind of thing. And of course, God revealed to him, no, I have now touched Paul's life. I have mm -hmm. transformed. And, and isn't that what it's really about? God transforming mm -hmm. lives. And Paul is saying, look, the other apostles didn't choose me mm -hmm. because at that time I wasn't called by God. But then when God called me, I was not transformed by men. I was transformed by Jesus Christ in mm -hmm. him alone. And, and if I can just point out for any of us, if we try to transform ourselves, it isn't going to work. Right. If we're going to trans be transformed by a men or a group of men, or that's not going to work. The only real transformation comes through Jesus Christ and him alone. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's why I think Paul says in verse 1, I am an apostle, but I'm not an apostle that was chosen of men. I'm not an apostle that was by any man, any leader. I was chosen by Jesus Christ and God the Father. Mm -hmm. I was chosen by them. And, and, and... You know, Tim and I would say, I, you know, I believe being in the ministry for 50 plus years now that, you know, there's evidence that it certainly was not man that did it. It certainly was not I that did it, mm -hmm. but that God did it, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, and, and that is just so real. Yeah. It's so, so, but you know something, Tim, I'm afraid that the church the fray is, is not allowing God to do his supernatural work as he wants to do it. You know, it's almost like we want to butt in and say, hey, God, I got a better idea. And God's shaking his head and saying, no, yep. you don't. You know, your ideas are going to, going to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Paul had to come on the scene and say, look, I was chosen by Jesus Christ. I was chosen by God the Father to go out and do the ministry in which God had called me to do. Now, was Paul a righteous man always? Absolutely not. Were any of us righteous men always? Absolutely not. You know, I have a past. I have a history. But guess what? God has seen to take that history and throw it away and mm -hmm. give brand new life. Any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened with the Apostle Paul. Yep. You know, and if we can look at Paul's life, and see the transformation, you know, that, that God can do if we allow God to do mm -hmm. the work. And that's what the gospel is all about. Yeah. You know, I can't add to the gospel. I'm told not to add to the gospel. Matter of fact, if you look at the book of the Revelation twice, does John say in the book of the Revelation, if you add anything to this book, I will add the plagues that are in this book to your life. Or if you delete... I will delete your name from, from the book of life. Mm -hmm. So don't add anything to it. God is complete in himself. 
You know, we can't we can't anything and add anything to it. And I think that's what Paul is trying to tell us here. Mm -hmm. And who is this Jesus, by the way? Paul defines him. The end of verse one, who raised him from the dead. Mm -hmm. We just celebrated Easter. We just celebrated. We had a great Easter. Tim in his body had a great Easter. Day. Just celebrating the wonderful resurrection. Without the resurrection, you have nothing. Mm -hmm. If Jesus Christ died on the cross and he stayed on the cross, you would have nothing. All right? Without the resurrection, there is nothing. But because of the resurrection and because of the ascension of Christ, we have everything. That's right. Because it's all power. It's all his power. Yes. So Paul goes and, and, and defines it, and, and he gives this little introduction about himself to the Galatian church so that he goes to them and says, look, you know, I'm not here because you know, your church council called me and wanted me to do this. I'm here because God called me and told me to do this, mm -hmm. you know. And, and I think he's setting the groundwork because he knew that there was discrepancies. He knew that there was a schism in the body. A mm -hmm. division in the body. And Paul says, look, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to give you God's word. Mm -hmm. This is what God says. Mm -hmm. Not Paul the apostle, not Timothy, not anybody else. This is what God says. Mm -hmm. But yet, along with that, I find it very, very interesting that he starts off by making it very clear that, look, I'm coming to you because of this role. But with what I'm about to say, you need to also understand this isn't just me. Mm -hmm. and, and I can't tell you the number of times I've read through the section of First Corin uh, of First Corinthians, yeah, <laughs> of Galatians 1 and have missed the small verse 2. Yep. And all the brothers and sisters with me. Yep. So it's like, I, I'm going to be writing some stuff to you that I have a right to write to you because, as he goes on to talk about later, if anyone preaches another gospel mm -hmm. other than what we've preached, now, one could look at that and say, well, that sounds a little dictator, dic dictatorial. dictatorial. Yeah. Um, but he prefaces this with this verse, too, that, look, I am coming to you on, number one, the authority that has been given to me by the Father and through Jesus Christ. But understand this as well. I also have the witness of all those that are with me that what I'm about to say to you is true. So there's almost this level of accountability that he is providing and, and the level of verification to the rest of, to this whole body, this whole church in the city of Galatia, that look, this isn't just my ideas that I'm sharing with you. I have others that also testify that this is truth. You know, one of the things I think very interesting, and, and um, this is just my own idea, is I think Jesus' half-brother, and a lot of people like to debate whether Mary had other kids or not, Scripture says she did. So therefore, I go with what Scripture says. Mm -hmm. But there's a half-brother by the name of James who really became the pastor of the church at Jerusalem, mm -hmm. which means that he, he was a strict Jew. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think what Paul is saying in verse 2 is even including this one who, who wants to keep to the letter of the law, who wants to do this. Now, he's trusted Jesus as his Savior. Mm -hmm. He's done all of this. But because of his past, because of his teaching, because of all this, he thinks that, well, there's got to be more to it. And Paul, I think, is including him in this verse, mm -hmm. too, saying, yes, James, I'm talking to you, too. You are my brother. Mm -hmm. Oh, you got some, some leftover stuff that we need to get rid of, mm -hmm. but <clears throat> you have trusted Christ as your Savior, and I'm talking to you, too. Mm -hmm. Just because you have this stuff, I'm not throwing you out of the camp. But what I want to do is I want to draw you into a deeper role into the camp mm -hmm. by telling you the, the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. So I, I think James, is, in my view at least, is included in this and the Jewish brethren because they're really some of the ones who are, who are saying, look, there's got to be more to it. There's got to be, mm -hmm. you know, there's got to be an act in which we can do. And that's what the Jews were, were looking at at that mm -hmm. point in time. Remember, they were having a hard time because it's always been about the Jews. Now, it's about the Gentiles. You know, not eliminating the Jews, but now God is adding this other dimension mm -hmm. that were not Jewish people. So they didn't hold to the festivals and the feasts and, and the laws and things of the Jewish religion. Mm -hmm. So, you know, are you going to force those things on these Gentiles who are non-religious? 
who you consider to be heathen, which God now is choosing to give the gospel to, mm-hmm. you can't do that. Right. Because if you do that, then, then they're going to reject it. Mm-hmm. So let's give them the straight gospel. Mm-hmm. They're really portraying to the other people that, look, if you want to have any hopes of being a Christian, a true Christian, you've got to somehow become Jew first. Yeah. And unless you first become a Jew, you can't become a Christian. That's right. ultimately what they're saying when they're trying to make the Gentiles yep. fit this mold of what God had really laid forth in the Old Testament law for the Israelites yep. specifically. You know, I find verse 3 very interesting as he goes and he says, okay, he introduces himself. Look, I'm chosen by God. I'm not chosen by man. Then he goes and says, and all the brethren, that means those who are who have this other idea mm-hmm. than we do, and I'm going to straighten that out, mm-hmm. which is what his main ministry is. I'm going to correct this problem. And then he goes and he says, this is how I'm going to do it. Grace be to you mm-hmm. and peace um, from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. First of all, I need you guys to look at grace. Mm-hmm. You know, and... and we're told that grace covers a multitude of sins, mm-hmm. right? And, and that doesn't mean that God just kind of overlooks them or whatever. But you know something? I think that, that you know, Paul is saying, wait a minute, people, look. In order for this to become solely what God would have us to do, we need to look beyond and say, hey, let's straighten up this matter. Let's get it right. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it's not a disgrace that, that, you, that you wanted to add this to it, mm-hmm. but now let's get it right. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's what, what really has to happen in the world today mm-hmm. is let's get it right. Mm-hmm. You know, not adding any, anything to it, not deleting anything from it. Right. Let's get it right. And to me, that's what Paul's whole goal is in this book. Mm-hmm. You know, getting it right. Yeah. So he says, grace be to you in peace, and it's not coming from Paul the Apostle. Right. Because if you knew the history of Paul the Apostle, he was a tyrant. Mm-hmm. You know, and now for him to walk in grace and peace, wait mm-hmm. a minute, something dramatic must have happened to this man. Mm-hmm. Remember, he wanted to kill the church. He wanted to destroy the church. He wanted to do away with the church. Mm-hmm. Now he's loving on the church, and he's bringing grace and mercy and mm-hmm. peace and comfort to the church. Wait a minute, what's happened mm-hmm. to this guy? Right. And Paul's able to say in verse 3, grace be to you, peace, but it comes from God. If you take my grace, it's going to fail you. Mm-hmm. If you take my peace, it's going to fail you. Mm-hmm. I love what Jesus says in John 14, 27. My peace I give unto you. Not mm-hmm. the peace that the world gives unto you. you know. And, and that's exactly what mm-hmm. we need to take the peace of Jesus Christ. Because mm-hmm. the peace of the world is going to fail us. Yeah. And, it, and what I want you to do is I want you to walk forth. It, the one who has sent me, the Father and the Son, yeah. that have sent me to you, now I give to you what they have given to me. Yeah. Grace and peace to you from the same source. You know, and, and when I think about that grace and peace, it was more, you know, a lot of times people look at this because this is something very common in a lot of Paul's letters that he mentions. But it's much more than just a phrase, like saying, hi, how are you? Yep. You know, it, it was much deeper. What he's really saying is, what's grace? You know, and grace is that, if you use the acrostic of God's riches at Christ's expense, it's understanding that we have the ability to walk in that which we do not deserve. Mm-hmm. You know, and so where mercy is, right, not, um, not receiving what we do deserve. Right, right. But here we're getting what we don't deserve. So... He's saying, what I give to you is that which you're not worthy of get, ha- receiving. Understand, your righteousness has nothing to do with us. Exactly. You know, it's about his grace. It's about all that he has done. All you had to do is just receive it. And so I want you to walk in everything that God has for you that you don't deserve, but he'd let you have. And I want you to have the wholeness right. That can only come in Him. That that sense of stability that can only be found in God Himself. You know, I, I think, you know, what Paul is saying to all of us is this: is it's not up to man to, mankind to muddy the waters. Mm-hmm. You know, because anytime we try to do something for God that's that's not from God, mm-hmm. then what are we going to do? We're going to muddy the waters. We're yeah. going to make a mess of it. And Paul is saying to us, look. To the Jewish believers, and they are believers, they are Christians, they're the brethren. In verse 2, to the Jewish believers, look, 
There were some things which you've got to see. But to the Gentile believers, there were going to be some things in which they need to see. And they need to grab a hold of. Yep. And because the Gentiles, they were always thought of as they're undeserving. They don't, you know, they can't receive it because they're, they're the lower class people, so to speak, whatever. And Paul will say, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Wait a minute. With God, there's no low class or high class. Mm -hmm. He's not a respectable person. Right. Well, you think about I even, want to take all of them. You think about even throughout all their teachings, uh, throughout the Old Testament, as, as is written and is proper, there's this aspect of Israel are God's chosen people. Right. They're referred to as God's chosen people. So what that began to conjure in their own minds is then to take it to a wrong level of, I am God's chosen, therefore you are God's forsaken. Yep. You know, and, and, and that's quite a jump. To, to go and make. And so now they're having to wrestle with a lot of these thoughts of, hey, we, we're the elite. We're the ones that have been set apart by God because all the others weren't worthy. So you can almost see how the enemy took this concept, something that God said that was very righteous and very true, that you are my chosen people, but how they allowed pride to infiltrate into it, to begin to think that somehow they were better yep. than everybody else. Yep. Yep. You know, and, and I, and, you know, and just as a, as a picture, and I just, I just want to share this little picture. We were just at the restaurant just a few moments ago before we came into the studio, and, and uh, a good friend of mine, he's a Catholic priest, um, and, you know, he, he always refers to me as pastor, Pastor Noyce, Pastor Harold, you know, which really, really, I, I, I so like because a lot of the others have never called me that. But this past, this uh, Catholic priest has. And I look at it and say, yeah, you know, I praise God for that. You know, that, that he's able to see, wait a minute, if we take this gospel and we present it, then they're going to see it. Mm -hmm. and, and to me, that is what it is. And, and what is it all about? Verse 4. Talking about Jesus Christ, verse 3, right? And from our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes and identifies who gave himself for our. Now, you take that word our, and who is he including? Mm -hmm. He's including the Jew. Thomas. He's including the Gentile. Mm -hmm. He's including himself. Yep. He's including all of us. Mm -hmm. He took all of our sin. Mm -hmm. Because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is what? Death. Mm -hmm. And then my favorite word is in there. But... Mm -hmm. The gift of God is what? Eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Mm -hmm. And Paul is now wanting to relate that both to the Jews and to the Gentiles. Hey guys, we all come here the same way. Mm -hmm. Not by works, not by what we think, but by Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and Him alone. Yeah. And that, those very f first three words of verse 4, who gave Himself for our sins. It's not that He was Offer, he didn't say he was offered up as a sacrifice. Says he gave himself. Right. It shows, who, and who was the power given? It wasn't on man taking his life from him, as Jesus said himself. I choose to lay down my life. Yeah. You know, and and this is what the effort effort is going to here is. Look, he did it all. He gave himself for the sins. We couldn't do anything to get rid of the sins. He did it all. And, and so again, it's coming back to this concept, this picture of grace, this picture of what he's about to um, uh, really address with them that works really has nothing to do with us. He did all the work. So in verse 4, he identifies Jesus. He identifies what Jesus did mm -hmm. in giving himself, laying down his life as a sacrifice for us. Yeah. Um, this week I've been looking up on the Passover, and I find, you know, that scripture verse where it says, Jesus Christ is our Passover. Mm -hmm. It's no longer the lambs or the goats or whatever that the Old Testament sacrificed. Mm -hmm. He was our eternal sacrifice for all of us. Mm -hmm. We no longer have to make those sacrifices because he gave his life once for all, for all sin. Mm -hmm. He died once for all, for all sin. So therefore, Paul is now identifying, and he says, let me tell you what he's done. He gave his life for us, right? First mm -hmm. part of verse 4, because of our sin, Mm -hmm. Because of us. But then what did he do? Okay, here I am. I'm laying down my life to you so that I can deliver you from this present evil world. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and to me that has two pictures. 
and I and I see it this way. And I I've been I've been also reading a lot about Christ presenting us as the bride to His Father, you know, mm -hmm. and that He may present to us a chaste virgin mm -hmm. unto Him, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. You know, to be able, when we go up into heaven and here's Jesus delivering us to the Father, here's my bride. Mm -hmm. You know, boy, that's, that's powerful to me. That's mm -hmm. as outstanding to me. But how about the present world? Mm -hmm. Not only am I going to deliver you to my Father in the future, but I'm going to deliver you from this evil world today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why, I, I, you know, mm -hmm. it's, it's today. Yeah. Today is the day of salvation. Yeah, Don't wait till tomorrow. And another way of looking at that word deliver is when we think about the deliverance of Israel from Egypt, right? This was not something that they could do on their own. They were slaves to the Egyptians. Someone had to come to deliver them out of. It, it gives a picture of rescue, to do for you what you're unable to do for yourself. Right. And, and so there's this aspect here of Christ, yes, delivering us to the Father, but first before he could do that, he had to deliver us, he had to rescue us from the clutches of sin, from the clutches of death, and that could, and, and from the clutches of sin, which could ultimately only come about through Jesus laying his life down for us. Yeah, you know, it's, it's so neat because he goes and says, look, I wanted to, Jesus Christ wants to, to deliver us from this evil world according to the will of God. Now he's gonna blow the Jews' minds because he uses the term, our father. Mm -hmm. You will not hear a Jew pray, Our Father which art in heaven. Mm -hmm. Why? They, they can't. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a part of their vocabulary. They have a hard time doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they even have, the, they have a hard time even mentioning the name Jehovah, you mm -hmm. know, because of the holiness of it and the righteousness of it. Well, Paul goes and says, Hey, by the way, he's God, and it's according to his will. Oh, by the way, he's my father too. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'm sure that some of them still, you know, step back and say, whoa, Paul, now you're hitting a level that, that I'm not sure we can accept. Mm. You know, because now you're bringing him to where we can have a relationship with God. Mm. You know, he can be our father. We can become his mm -hmm. children. You know, that is contrary to, to what they've been teaching. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and Paul now brings it home to them and say, hey, wait a minute. God wants to be your father. He not only wants to be your God. Mm -hmm. But he wants to be your father mm -hmm. in a relationship. That's why, you know, both Tim and I have said this on this program many, many times. We're not here teaching religion, okay? I hate religion. I really, really do. But I love relationship. Mm -hmm. And that's what Paul is trying to show the Jewish believers mm -hmm. and the Gentile believers. Wait a minute. It's not religion. It's not in religion. Mm -hmm. It is in a relationship. You got God. But now let's bring him even closer and call him our father. Yeah, because it's not just the relationship. Like I said, that's, that, that was strange enough. But the depth of the relationship, because he's referred to, to God as in context of being the father of Christ as mm. well. And Christ throughout all of his uh, time on earth referred to God the father as his father. father right. So now with him saying, to do the will of our God and Father, it's not only identifying our relationship with God, it's our relationship with Christ. Because if he is our Father and he is also Christ's Father, in a sense, then what does that make us with Christ? You know, what, what does that make us as now we're being talked about as family here? Yeah, we're one with him. Hmm. And, and that is a real, I mean, we want to talk about grace to the nth degree. Yeah. You know, a people that are sinners, uh, full of sin, being in that kind of a family relationship with a sinless God, that, that was earth shattering. You know, I think I, one thing that I want to bring out in verse four that, that just really has struck me with this is we need to keep it in context to what is being said. First of all, he is God. And now he is father. Mm-hmm. I'm afraid that in much of Christendom today, and in our church today, yeah. is we have lost the respect. Mm -hmm. All we want to do is see him as Father, mm -hmm. but not see him as God. Right. And I, I really believe that we need to get back to, okay, he's God, and he's my Father, with the respect and with the due diligence that is needed. And in that order. Yeah. 
Exactly. Because I think that what we've done is even those that do acknowledge that he's both, we refer to him, and I know, and I'm not making fun of, you know, because I know sometimes mm -hmm. we say things, you know, and just because it rolls off the tongue a little bit easier. But there's something deeper that goes with this concept of referring to him as Father God. Yeah. I see him as Father first, and oh yeah, then God. Yeah. Well, no, we need to see him first of all as God. To understand that he is first and foremost holy, he really doesn't owe us anything. Yeah. You know, we owe him everything. You know, he is the holy God, we are the unholy people. But yet, as in that role of being God, he so loved us that he chose to be our Father. Yeah. And to make that possible. Versus the attitude of thinking of him simply as Father first and getting all these nice little warm fuzzies and then now maybe I can accept you as God. Yep. It yeah, carries and, a totally different feel. Yeah, to me, that's, that's very dangerous, mm -hmm. is to, you know, to have this relationship. Oh, you know, I'm his child, and I can cuddle up to him, and, you know, but, yeah, if I feel like being good, I'll be good, but if I don't feel like being good, well, he's my father, and that's okay. I, I find verse 5 keeps that context, Tim, mm -hmm. in that to whom? Who's the to whom? First of all, God, and then Father. Mm -hmm. You know, he keeps the context. He doesn't switch them. He doesn't uh, make it any less. But he says, to whom be glory? You know, and, and my view, as I watch the church, you know, and, and see what's happening in the church, um, you know, as an observer, but also as a part of it, I'm looking at it and saying, are we truly bringing God the glory mm. that is due his holy name? Mm. You know, or am I just kind of playing at it? And, you know, Paul is, is talking to us and saying, look, this is not a game. Mm -hmm. We are not just to play at it. This is something that God has to do mm -hmm. in us. You know, and when he does it, it's going to be done right, and it's that's going to right. be done perfectly. And, and that's why Paul is going, and he's sharing this with us, to whom be glory, and how long does that last? Forever. Forever, Forever and ever. Once again, it is not just a momentary thing. And then I love that word amen mm -hmm. to me because amen says, look, I've spoken it, that's it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's no more um, adding to it. There's no more PSs, PSS, you know, and going, mm -hmm. no, no, no. This is it. Yeah. This, is, this is the final pronouncement before I get into mm -hmm. other things. We got to make sure that we give God glory and Father glory mm -hmm. in that order. Yeah. And it even taking it to that point of even so, now let it be done. Yeah. It's ultimately what it's saying there is, okay, I've stated all this stuff. Yeah, he's, he has gave himself for sins. He's rescued us. But we want his will to be done so that he will get glory. No, I don't want anything to stand in the way of that. It's, right. like the, it's the exclamation point, the double underline, and the yellow highlighter all over the whole text. And don't you find it very interesting that in verse 5, at the end of verse 5, he uses amen. Then he gets into verse 6, and it says, let me tell you why I said the amen. Because I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another people. Mm -hmm. So he's saying, look, I've said, the, you know, this, this is the way it ought to be. So why mm -hmm. are you out doing your own thing? Mm -hmm. Or why are you out doing something different, trying to mm -hmm. add to it or delete from it or, you know, whatever? Wait a minute, no. This mm -hmm. is the amen. Yeah. You know, this is, this is where the rubber meets the road. Mm -hmm. You've got to have God which wants to be your father, and you are to live in that, and in his grace, and in his peace, for his glory, mm -hmm. that's it. Right. And, it, and that aspect there of, you know, I'm, I am astonished that you're so soon removed. We got to be careful, because uh, I think sometimes in, in our current way of reading that, in our current vernacular, we could tend to look at that almost as though this is a passive thing. You know, like I'm here and somebody could remove me. Yeah. You know, uh, how are you so soon removed? Like, like it's something that somebody pulls you away. And one aspect it is somebody, if that person's called Satan. Right. But it really is talking about why do you so quickly desert? It's like, why are you removing yourself? That's it. That's it. From this situation. It's not that somebody's pulling you away. It's not that the devil made me do it. It's why are you making this choice? Yep. in and of yourself when you know better. You know, and, and we're seeing this, and once again, I don't want to get on the soapbox, and, and that is not what this program is all mm -hmm. about, 
But how many times do we hear as pastors that, you know, people say, well, I haven't been to church over the last few weeks because, well, you know, I've had family come and visit me, and I've had this, and I've had this. What's happening? No, they're not removing you. What you've done is you have placed yourself where that is what you want to do. Mm-hmm. Instead of coming to church or instead of, you know, it's, it's the same thing with doing mm-hmm. devotion. It's the same thing with doing our prayer yeah. life. It's the same thing in any of that. If mm-hmm. we allow anything to remove us, it is because we are allowing that. Mm-hmm. And it's understanding how when we open up that door that the enemy works that. Because mm-hmm. what I've seen, and I know my dad as well could testify to this, because I, I, in fact, that's why I kind of got the idea initially. And I found as I've looked at life over the years, it's like, yeah, you know, he was very right on this. And I remember him sharing once uh, during one of his messages back in, all the way back in the 80s, or wow. probably early 80s. you got a good memory. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wish I could remember all those messages that well. But I remember him saying, be very, very careful because what will happen is the enemy is very deceptive and he will come in if you let him. Mm-hmm. And that was the key, if you let him. It's, it still comes on my choice. He's like, the first thing he'll do is he'll remove you from the church. Yep. The second thing he'll do is he'll remove you from your Bible reading. Yep. And the third thing he'll do is remove you from prayer. Yep. And he doesn't usually do all three at once. He'll do those Does pretty casually. much in that air or in that, in that order. And, and like I said, when we hear these people that state that, well, I haven't been church, well, but I'm still reading my Bible. Yep. But I'll guarantee you go back to them a few months later. If you were to ask them the same question, if they were really honest with you, you'd find that, well, no, you know what? I'm not spending the time I used to. Mm -hmm. And they gradually allow themselves to be pulled away from those things. So could we take in verse 6 and and read it this way? And this is once again, just reading it this way. He's looking at at the church at Galatia. He's looking at the Gentiles and saying, you Gentiles, you are leaving because you're blaming the Jews. Oh, you Jews... You're leaving because you're blaming the Gentiles. But guess what? Both of you are leaving because you want to. Mm-hmm. You know, and it just seems to be that way, that, that you're allowing this to happen. Mm-hmm. You know, so he's not just blaming one group over another. I think he's looking at both groups and saying, hey, wait a minute, Gentiles. Don't blame the Jews. You're doing it because your heart's not really there right now. Mm-hmm. Or Jews, you're blaming the Gentiles because what? Your heart is not there right mm-hmm. now. So don't blame anybody. You're doing it because that's what you want to do. Mm -hmm. Not what God would have you to do, not according to the will of God the Father, but according to what you want to do. Mm -hmm. And so therefore he's talking to the Gentiles, or to the Galatian church, excuse me, and saying you are so soon removed only because you want to remove yourself. Mm -hmm. And you're blaming somebody else so that you don't feel guilty. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't go to that church because that church is full of hypocrites. Well... Can I tell you, if you join it, it's going to have one more? Just a simple thought, okay? Because, why? That's, that's exactly how it is. If, if, I, if I say I'm not going to go because it's full of hypocrites, then what am I doing? I'm judging those people, I'm looking at those people, mm-hmm. and I'm putting myself ahead of those people or above those people, and I become just like those people. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. you know, I'm sorry. God is not going to, you know, when you stand before Christ, he's not going to accept any of these excuses. Mm-hmm. You know, when he says, well, how come you didn't go to church because of this? And you try to give your excuse, and God says, no, 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 no excuses. You know, no, no, no. That's, that's mm-hmm. not going to fit what I have here. Mm-hmm. And, and so Paul is presenting, I think, to both the Gentiles and to the Jews, hey, both of you guys are guilty. You know, mm-hmm. I'm not putting one against the other. You're both guilty of this. Then he goes in verse 7, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. And Paul even calls it a perversion. Mm-hmm. But yeah. even before we get into verse 7, okay. I think it's important for us to also hit on the fact that they're not only quickly deserting, it says that in the process of deserting, they are now turning to something, something else. else. And it's understanding that when we let something kind of creep away or we allow ourselves to step away from, whether it's going to church, whether it's our Bible reading, we are in so doing choosing to turn towards another gospel. So you're replacing. And you're replacing it. Right. So you're replacing the perfect, mm-hmm. Jesus Christ, with something that's imperfect. Right. Why would we want to do that? Mm-hmm. It's like people who worship angels. You know, and I, and I have people talk to me, well, you know, I worship this angel, I worship this thing. Why do you want to go to something lesser? That mm-hmm. doesn't make any sense to me. Right. When you got the perfect, 
Jesus Christ, and now you want to submit to something lesser? That doesn't make any That just, mm-hmm. to me, is beyond reason, mm-hmm. you know, on my comprehension. And Colin's being a bad boy saying it's almost time. So, you know, I'm looking at this, and, and you just can't help it. I mean, he's talking about the grace of God, verse 6, and then he says, look, which is not another, but, but be some that trouble you, that would pervert the gospel. Let's be careful not to pervert, not add to, not delete from the mm-hmm. simple gospel. Let me tell you what it is. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 and 4. This is the gospel. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. This is the gospel, period. Mm -hmm. Don't add anything to it. Don't delete anything from it. Those things is what makes up the gospel. This is what Jesus Christ has done. Don't add works to it. Don't add anything else. Don't add programs to it. Don't add religious rites to it. No. He died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. That is the gospel. Mm -hmm. And and that's so important is understanding what is really perversion. It's not lies necessarily, though they are a form of lying, can be a part of that. But this concept of perversion is taking something that looks almost like the original and somehow I've just twisted it just enough. Twisted it just a little bit, you know. Um, we've got all kinds of, probably best way we think of, you know, when people read that word perversion or pervert, you know, they tend to think in textual connotations. Right. Well, if we think about it from that standpoint, what are we saying? We're saying, you know, when somebody uses that phrase for towards another is you are somehow u- using that physical act in a way it was not intended. And you're calling it something that it really isn't. That's, and this is what we're doing with Christianity a lot of times, is we're calling something Christianity that really isn't. Doesn't Jesus, even when he is going before the Pharisees, mm-hmm. what does he say to them? Oh, you adulterous generation. Mm-hmm. That's a form of perversion. Yeah. You adulterous generation. Mm-hmm. And are we even becoming an adulterous generation because we are putting something above who Jesus Christ truly right. is. We're putting something above God the Father, our God, and we're mm-hmm. putting something above the Father, and that's our own wishes, our own desires. Mm-hmm. And then he says, if any man preach any of the gospel, let him be accursed. And then he says, for do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. If I'm gonna bow down to the wishes of man, then I'm not serving mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And Jesus Christ did not bow down to the wishes of man, right. and neither should we. Mm-hmm. And in essence saying, buckle your seatbelt. Yep. You know, make sure you got a nice, good, comfortable seat because you're going to get some spankings in a yep. minute. Because yep. I'm not going to bow to what you guys want. I'm not going to bow to what is going to tickle your ears. What I'm going to share are going to be some hard things. Yep. But things that are very full of power and very full of life. You know, if I can just use a, 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 an analogy of today, I think it's time for Christians Christian men, pull up your big boy pants. Christian women, pull pull up your big girl pants. And let's get going because Paul is going to hit us where we need to be Mm -hmm. hit. I'm Pastor Harold Noyes, pastor of the Community Christian Church. And once again, thank you so much for tuning into Hotline Ministry. Uh, We're starting this whole new series in the book of Galatians. I hope you tune in every week to get the full impact of what this this, uh, book is all about. If you're in the Athens area, we'd love to have you come at 9.30 on Sunday morning. We're meeting every week or 6 o'clock every Sunday evening. We have Bible studies. You can call the office about that. And if you're in the Charlestown area, join us at the old St. Luke's Episcopal Building at 188 Main Street. And worship us there is Life on Main. Uh, coffee hour at 10 o'clock, service at 11. Uh, great time in the Word as we gather together. We just want to thank you guys so much for tuning in. And if you're enjoying this program, let us know. Let your friends know. Uh, they can tune in on any of the uh, community TV stations from the lower corner of uh, Vermont along the Connecticut River all the way up towards Springfield and then up in the Northeast Kingdom, as well as being able to tune into this on the internet through factthenumber8.com or on our Facebook page at Heartline Ministries. And if you don't like to watch it and you're kind of on the go a lot, you just want to listen to it, pull us up on any of the uh, popular podcast providers and can listen to the program in its entirety there.
You know, I want to thank my buddy uh, Ron Golden, Pastor Ron Golden, Tim's dad, sitting in. Ron, once again, it's always a joy to have you here with us. Um, one of these days we're going to have him speak up and put his two cents worth in too. But thank you so much for watching Heartline Ministry. Jesus.